Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. It's our second session in uh, this year's public pre-K technical assistance series. There's a total of eight sessions. Um, and our first one has already occurred and is recorded and um, stored on our early childhood resources page, which we can uh, share in a little bit. I did just want to take a moment and do a quick introduction. My name's Nicole Medor. I'm the early childhood specialist at the DOE. Um, and our team is directed by Leanne Larson. Um, you can see her photo and email information there. And I'm gonna hand it over to Marcy to introduce herself real quick. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Marcy Whitcomb. I'm the public pre-K consultant uh, for the Department of Education on the early learning team. And I will hand it to Sue Gallant. Thank you. I'm Sue Gallant. I am the public, uh, the pre-K expansion consultant and I offer technical assistance along with Marcy and I'm gonna hand it over to Jane. Hello everyone, my name is Jane Kersling. I'm the contract grant specialist for the pre-K expansion grant. Thanks guys. And then we also have on our team, Stacy McCoy. Uh, she is new to our team as the Head Start State Collaboration Director and I'm sure she'll be joining us um, possibly on some of these series. If not, her information is there as well in the event that anybody needs to contact Stacy. Some quick housekeeping pieces. Um, we do have a brief agenda to help guide our work through today's session. We are going to take some time to pay some close attention and review the topics that are scheduled for today. Uh, we'll identify wherever documents are located or other resources that we mention. Um, and certainly we want to allow time at the end for any discussion, questions, clarifications that might come up. With that in mind, I always encourage folks to interrupt me or, or any of us at any point if something comes up to you that you want more clarification on as we're describing it, we're more than happy to pause and, and, and do that. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, no problem. We, we're happy to wait until the end and provide time then. So our topic for today is public pre-K partnerships, their memorandums of understandings or MOUs, and also childcare licensing. So me and Marcy and Sue are gonna sort of flip flop between slides and um, really try and detail the specifics to each of these three pieces that go into partnering to provide public pre-K programming. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sue. Thank you. So we're gonna talk about what a community partner is. So first off, it's a licensed child care provider, licensed through the Office of Child and Family Services, who is a member of your community, and they are going to provide um, pre-K programming for your school. Next bullet. All right, so here's some examples of community partners. And this, this is not a limited list. This could be outside of this list. Private family child care providers, private center-based child care, Head Start agencies, the YMCA, often they offer pre-K programming, as do the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. So any of these programs that are going to start to provide programming with you could be a community partner. Community partners are part of the school and pre-K programming remains free for families to access. So they're not charging a fee for this. Sometimes programs may charge fees for before and after care that go beyond what the school day is, but not for the pre-K programming. Community partners programs must align to chapter 124 standards to all of those, just as the school programs. And a partnership has a formal MOU or memorandum of understanding with the district that outlines responsibilities and financial arrangements between the two agencies. So we wanna clarify what a community partner is not. It's not an unlicensed provider within the community. So folks have to be licensed. It's not just a friendly relationship where, you know, you might work with a, a child care and they may take care of your kiddos before or after school, but they are not offering pre-K programming. It doesn't just, this, a community partner doesn't just support you verbally or in writing. They're actively providing support and services for your kiddos. It doesn't offer just before and after school care. So this means that they're providing programming during the day 
They do not only provide transportation to and from schools. Those are other kinds of partnerships, but they're not partnerships that we're addressing as a pre-K partnership. And they do not have to be nationally accredited, all right? So they don't have to have their NACI accreditation or any of those things. And I think, I think we were good. Perfect. Yep, yeah. I'm gonna hand it off to Marcy. Yep, and I will hand to Marcy, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the benefits of partnerships. So why do we partner um, with uh, programs around our communities? There are a lot of benefits, not just for the schools, but for the community partners as well, programs. Um, and those benefits extend to not just the schools and programs, but also to children and families. And they include fewer transitions between programs for children. So if students or children are in a child care for before school care or after school care, and they're in that program for that public school piece in the middle of the day, um, they're not transitioning from home to school or from home to program to child care, to programming, back to child care, back to home, or any version of that. There, there's one transition, which makes it a lot easier for not only the children themselves, but for families as well. Uh, this also increases choices for families. Uh, there are different um, districts who have set it up so families have choices between, uh, say, a family child care, a child care center, Head Start program, and or a classroom that's actually in the school. Um, but it also gives them choices if they need before or after care or something that's maybe closer to their work or their home, that sort of thing. So there's a lot, a lot more choices for families around um, the benefits. Shared resources between um, schools and community programs. There's a lot of uh, um, opportunity to share professional development resources with teachers and child care providers. There's um, resources to share around family engagement. And then, of course, child information, assessment, screening tools, that sort of thing, or screening outcomes, that sort of thing, when children are transitioning into kindergarten out of a program or into pre K out of a program. Um, again, educator collaboration, which is part of the shared resources, and then instructional overlap. There's a lot of alignment that, that happens through these programs so that students, families, and schools and programs all understand sort of what's, what's happening. It's aligned, the instructional um, pieces of the day sort of align to each other so all the children are in the same place. Professional development, <laughs> again, we talked about that. Um, and the potential for multiple fundraising streams. So when you have a partnership, um, there is a certain amount of funding that comes from the school EPS formula. There's a certain amount of funding that may come from a Head Start agency, if that's your partner. Um, and when you're working on the memorandum of understanding, which we will get to shortly, um, it's a really good place to sort of talk about all of those funding streams, where they're coming from, how they're working, and who's sort of, um, you know, doing what with that sort of thing. And then, of course, there's the ability to serve a higher number of pre-K students and their families. A lot of our schools in this state are older with smaller classrooms or just small schools. They don't have the space to add additional um, your new pre-K classrooms. So partnering is a way to get that done where there is space, where there's already, um, already uh, opportunities in the community for those children for care. And it's just it makes it a lot easier to have that space available. And so who is a potential partner and how do you find them? So as Sue had mentioned, a community partner is any licensed provider in your catchment area who serves four-year-olds, which again includes Head Start programs, family child cares or in-home child cares that are licensed and um, center child cares among the other ones that she gave us before. And then how do you find those providers if you're not familiar with them? So when you're thinking about starting this process, um, working with your community, community providers is very important um, in the partnering process, but also just sort of seeing what's out there in your community. Um, Child Care Choices, the website is linked here, and I'm sure it will be thrown in the chat room by one of my colleagues in just a second. Um, this website will give you by town, by location, um, a list of child care areas, uh, a list of, that are licensed, and I think there's other information on what ages 
they have their hours, you know, that sort of thing, uh, contact information. It's a really amazing website to find all of those programs that might be in your area. And with that, I'm going to throw it over to Nicole. Thanks, Marcy. And it looks like that was thrown in the chat. Thank you, Sue. Okay, so a, a, about a year or so ago, maybe a little more than that, um, our department hosted a three-part series to working with community partners to provide um, public pre-K programming. And one of the things that we created for that series was this map to partnership, sort of a step-by-step. Um, really just to offer as a guide and a visual resource to those that are interested in the process. Um, certainly not the only way um, to get to a partnership, but to offer some ideas and resources that can help folks along the way. So the very first step that we always recommend um, public schools do is a community needs assessment. And that can really be done in uh, a multitude of ways. I would argue that the most common form of needs assessment that we see completed is through a survey. Um, so ultimately the public school will create a survey for the community, for the families in their town to complete that identifies the needs of that household. Um, are both parents working? Is it a one parent home? Um, are they, is the child currently in some type of childcare setting? If so, what type family? a center, family, friend, and neighbor. Um, if our school offered pre-K, what would be the ideal setting um, or the ideal dosage or the ideal um, program, you know, for your child and your family and really start to get that information because I guarantee some folks will say, we want all day, full week programming for my four-year-old. And others will say, that's too much. Our child will be fine with full day part week or part day full week, right? There's all different types of scenarios um, and answers that you could get. But gathering that information and really understanding the needs of your community is gonna help you determine, A, if you need a partner and B, who that partner might be. So once you have um, that sort of determined, then you can start thinking about who a potential partner in your community could be. So we did offer that resource really quickly, uh, that link to childcare choices. Um, another scenario that we've seen is once folks have names and numbers and um, access points for licensed providers in their community, then they start to do that outreach. Sometimes they'll call each provider one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes they'll host an event at the school and invite all of those community providers to come and talk and, and listen and ask questions and, and talk about um, you know, the challenges that might surface with this. Again, no black and white perfect way. There's a variety of different um, scenarios that we've seen play out. And many, if not all of them, have been successful to some degree. Um, so from there, then you can start to forming your partnership if, if it's applicable and doing your community outreach. So start a conversation and meet with the members of your community and those folks that have completed your survey, as well as your bus drivers, as well as um, uh, any before and after school programs, things like that. And then start to identify who's going to do what, who's going to identify or start to identify the roles and responsibilities of the entities, of the public school and of the licensed provider. We can bring family coaching to the table. We can bring professional development to the table. We can bring family style meals to the table. We can bring transportation to the table and really start to go down line by line. What is going to make your ideal high quality program? What's that going to look like? And then who can do what? Um, the biggest thing here is to work collaboratively and communicate together to create a memorandum of understanding or an MOU. So in that MOU, again, these vary. Um, sometimes I love saying it's up to you to create and sometimes I hate it. I, sometimes I wish I had. Nope, this is what our MOU looks like and this is the format and this is what you need to, to turn into us. But that's simply not the case. Um, we're really flexible and really understanding that our communities and their partnerships throughout the state are really unique to the communities that they're serving. Um, so a one size fits all model just doesn't work. Um, but an MOU regardless must be completed and reviewed annually so that that partnership can remain in place and continue to receive funding through the state side of things uh, for those four-year-old students. So typically we see that MOUs include fiscal information, who's paying for what, how, is, how are these programs being funded, 
things like spacing, classroom spacing, indoor and outdoor um, facilities, furniture, supplies, and any other resources that are needed for the space. Of course, curriculum and professional development needs and staffing needs. So staffing needs is, are really unique. In, in some partnerships in Maine, the public school takes on full responsibility for all the staff. Every staff member that enters that public pre-K classroom is uh, an employee of the school district. That's fine. In other scenarios, it, it's a shared, right? It's a mixed delivery. One individual in the classroom might be the employee of the school. Another employee in the classroom might be in, um, that of the partner. And just the opposite. In other partnerships, all of the staffing come from the licensed provider um, and not from the school at all. Right. As long as folks are meeting certification requirements, uh, background checks, things like that that are needed for license and or DOE, um, then you're good to go. But certainly those are the types of sections uh, that an MOU will address so that everybody is clear and understanding um, the operation of the of the program. So an MOU is going to clearly outline those specific points of understanding. It's going to name who the parties are, describe the partnership on which they're agreeing, define its scope and the details at each party's roles and responsibilities. In order to produce an MOU, the participating partners must reach mutual understanding. And that's not going to happen in one meeting or in one phone call or in one email, right? That, that mutual understanding is going to happen over time. It can't be rushed. You're both bringing something really unique to the table and both parties and both um, experiences need to be really thought out and listened to in order for this to work and work well. The process often begins with each partner effectively drafting their own sort of best case MOU, right? This is something that I'm gonna be proud of and I'm gonna sign off on year to year and then see where the commonalities lie, see where some conversation needs to happen. Each party considers their ideal or their preferred outcomes. Hopefully they're the same, if not very close. Um, and if they're not, more conversation needs to be had. They're also gonna write down what they believe they have to offer to the other partner and what points may be non-negotiable on their side. And really that comes into play specifically with um, either nationally accredited license programs or Head Start programs. Um, Head Start agencies or grantees across the nation have very specific frameworks that they need to follow and they're considered non-negotiable, like family style eating, for example, right? In public school, we don't have that same non-negotiable, but if we wanna partner with the Head Start, then that's something that needs to be discussed because it's, it's non-negotiable for them. Um, so those are the things that we mean when we say non-negotiable on their side. The other non-negotiable for a licensed provider um, might be their fingerprint and background check. Um, licensing requires that, as does DOE certification. That's the good news. The bad news is that both of those background checks are different. Um, and each entity that, that each um, higher power needs proof that that individual has had the required background check. Um, so that's something else to consider. And there are others. Uh, during the process, each side learns what's most important to the others before moving forward. And it's very possible that you get to this point and you say, maybe this isn't going to work, or maybe this isn't going to work as soon as we thought it would. And that's okay. It can't be rushed, right? It has to be something that happens over time and is agreeable to everybody at the table. Um, we do have a couple uh, quick links here. The first one is a partnership proposal. Um, and that link will bring you to a Google Doc that you can copy for your own saving and your own editing. Uh, we would never see it or, or have any access to it unless you shared it with us specifically. And it's really just a guide, another way of sort of mapping out the conversation uh, of an MOU. It was actually created for us um, by a partner in Southern Maine. They worked closely with their local school district as well as our main chapter of the Association for the Education of Young Children. And so the partner, MAEYC, and the school district worked together to create this proposal for themselves um, and shared it with us. And we really loved it. So we de-identified it and, and now have it as available as a copy. 
Um, so some folks may find that helpful. And then the other uh, link on the bottom there is, um, this is in my way, thank you. Uh, we'll bring you to our professional learning and resources page and we have some sample MOUs available there as well. Um, again, just something to help guide the conversation and, and some folks find it helpful. And thank you, because I think Sue or Marcy put that in the link. Um, another uh, resource that we often direct folks to is uh, the three-part series that I mentioned earlier. This was something that we did a little while ago. Um, and the second clip or the second recording of that series was when we invited panelists from um, different agencies across the state. And they came together and we asked them some, um, some questions about their partnerships, what their challenges were, why they decided to partner in the first place, um, their continued efforts in maintaining those partnerships, or if their partnerships dissolved, what may have uh, been the cause of that. So I highly recommend anybody that's seeking to be a partner to watch all three videos. But if you only have time for one, watch the panelist contributions in the second session. Um, that's going to offer you, I think, the most uh, relatable information because all of the information is coming from folks that have already done this work and continue to uh, maintain their partnerships or, like I said, maintain communication around partnerships. Um, and the second session video as well um, on the right-hand side, and I can share this in a moment to show you what I mean, but on the right-hand side of the video, it's chunked out by prompts. Um, so for example, if you wanted to hear what their experiences were for barriers in their partnership, you could just go to that section. Um, at the very end, the final prompt was what would, the question to panelists was, what would be your advice to districts or licensed providers seeking to partner for pre-K programming? Um, and that's a really great clip too, just to sort of hear what each panelist had to say. So wanted to just mention that too. Okay, I'm gonna toss it back to Marcy real quick. And I will unmute before I start talking. Um, so another thing that we're doing to support districts and partners um, is we're offering, Sue and I are offering public pre-K open office hours and those are available to teachers, administrators, care providers, um, anybody, directors. <clears throat> um, the dates are here. They're the first and third, third Thursday of the month from three to four. Um, we have one left this month, as you can see on the 20th, and then two dates in May and two dates in June. Um, there's a Zoom meeting link at the bottom, which I'm going to assume Sue's going to pop into the chat room because she's doing really good at that. Uh, the Zoom link is the same for each meeting, so you don't have to get a new one. You don't have to register. You can show up, ask a question. You can hang out with us for an hour. You can be there for five minutes, whatever your needs are and whatever, um, anything that you'd like. And also, if you're unable to be there, just know that all of us are are available via email to help with um, any support or resources or guidance that's needed. And that leaves us to our question and discussion hour or half hour or however long it takes. <laughs> so the floor is open for anybody who has any questions or anything they want to discuss or otherwise. I was going to just share my screen to show. Thanks, Nicole. So this is um, what I had mentioned a moment ago, this uh, second session of this series where we spoke with panelists. Um, and you can see here on the right-hand side, there are some keywords that are pulled out and um, time-stamped. So if any of these uh, interest you as opposed to watching it from start to finish, then that might be helpful in accessing. And if you'd like, I can share um, just a couple of their final prompts. Thank you, Kate Nanny. Um, we do have a question in the chat box that I want to address, but before I do that, we have our final prompt. Um, so I just wanted to ask all panelists to take turns and, and maybe 
15 seconds or less, offer one or two tidbits of advice that you would give to prospective partners. So or maybe in other words, what piece of advice did you wish you had that could be beneficial for others? Go ahead, Sue. Um, I believe that one of the most important pieces of partnership is taking time to plan and not jumping into the situation before you've really um, had a chance to involve the key stakeholders on both teams. Uh, having the stakeholders on both teams engaged and um, on board with moving forward with the partnership has been really important um, in the process. Um, it's important for people to be able to ask questions and be able to um get their doubts um at least heard if not resolved um because no matter how hard you try and how wonderful um a superintendent and i may think that a partnership is that doesn't mean that the kindergarten teacher is thinking that this is a good idea at all um, so it's really important to have those key partners um, in the on both teams in, involved in the process, in the discussions to understand what it is that our goals are, what it is we want to accomplish, and why in the world would we even, you know, try to partner with, with another entity, with another agency. Um, so that, that to me is um, extremely important. Um, I also think it's really important to appreciate the strengths that each of the partners and their team bring to the table. Um, it's if if that um, appreciation is not there, it makes um, it makes change difficult. It makes moving forward difficult. Um, I can say from experience that having a member, a team member that said, well, that's not the way we do it in every other classroom. Um, is not helpful in um, in working as a partner. Um, to be a partner, you you need to have a, a mindset of compromise and um, appreciating that there are many experts sitting around the table, and we all bring something different to that discussion and um, trust, and um, all of that is important in uh, moving that forward. Thank you. So that section goes on and, and the others respond as well, but I did just want to share uh, Tracy's quick tidbit. Okay. Carrie, Nicole, any questions that you all have at the moment? <laughs> I think I'm all set. I just wanted to know more what the process was like. Yeah. Um, so now I have a better understanding and I know I need to reach, my goal is to reach out more to them once they hire somebody and yeah. try to work a little bit more collaboratively. I know that it's all written out already in an MOU. I just want to, I just want to work closer, I guess. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I, oh, sorry, so I'll let you talk in just a second. I, um, I was just going to say real quick, hopefully, you know, <laughs> how much we want to help support that and, and any way that we can just let us know. Um, I will most certainly. Thank you. Good. Yeah. I was going to say, we also have a Head Start collaboration director in our office, Stacy, and she's really beneficial with some of those pieces too. If you guys get stuck around the, the, the have tos or this is how we always do it and finding those compromises. I don't anticipate that with the group you're working with, but Thank she's you. good at thinking outside the box. Well, that's good. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, I was just chatting with Nicole in, in the chat box. Um, yeah, so so she knows where to find us. Um, I know that her hands are tied at the moment, but uh, happy to to help assist at any point beyond uh, these recordings and these sessions. So um, no trouble at all. And I'll make sure that the link to this recording gets shared out to everybody that was registered as well.